Well, we are in week two of a sermon series we're calling Ancient Practices, and it is all about prayer. And if you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome, by the way. Uh, I don't know, maybe you're not even a Christian. You're hearing, okay, uh, a sermon series on prayer. Pastor gets up and teaches Christians about prayer. That maybe there's nothing more stereotypical than a pastor teaching on prayer. Uh, that's like what Christians do, right? They pray. But as it turns out, many Christians, maybe even most Christians, actually have a really hard time praying. Uh, Crossway did a survey in 2019 of 14,000 Christians and asking a whole bunch of different questions about prayer. But one of the key takeaways was this. When asked how people were, how satisfied people were with their prayer life, these are Christians, 2% said that they were very satisfied with their prayer life. 2%. So uh, I just want to start with a place of, like, permission and honesty here. Uh, How many of you would feel like you are in the other 98%? (laughs) Like, there is room for improvement when it comes to our prayer life, right? Look around. This, me too, uh, this is a safe place. You are not alone. We are in this thing together. I remember the very first time I prayed out loud. Uh, I was 17 years old. I was a non-Christian in a high school youth group. I was invited by a group of friends, uh, guys that I'd become friends with, and I walked in, was experiencing this form of church for the very first time, so I walked in, the pastor taught a sermon on a Wednesday night, there were some worship songs, I had no idea any of the words, and then we broke out into something called small groups, and then uh, we sat in a circle, there was like eight of us guys, and we talked about the sermon for a few minutes, and then somebody said, let's pray. And everybody uh, bowed their heads and closed their eyes, and so I kind of did this. And uh, they went around in a circle, and these high school guys prayed out loud. And, uh, and then it got to the point where the circle got to me, and everybody had prayed except for me. And I'm sitting there staring at my shoes, thinking, there is no way they're going to make the new non-Christian guy pray out loud. And then the guy next to me nudged me, and I looked up, and everybody's heads were still bowed and eyes closed. And I was like... Oh, God. And the same guy next to me <laughs> leans over and whispers, that's a good start. And, uh, and so I, 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 that's what I did. I, I prayed out loud. It was like the most awkward, stumbly. I'm pretty sure I used words like beseech and bestow because, you know, Jesus spoke Old English. That's his first language. And, and it was like so awkward. But I stumbled my way through it, and the guys in the room met me with nothing but grace. And I surprisingly, kept coming back to this place. Uh, And a few weeks later, I surrendered my life to Jesus. I began following him. And you'll be surprised to find out my prayer life did not get better immediately. It was still awkward. It was still difficult. It felt a little bit like I was a fish out of water for a long time. And so I want you to hear me when I say I learned maybe for the first uh, firsthand experience what Ronald Rollheiser has said about prayer, which is this, that the only rule of prayer is just to show up and keep showing up. If you feel like you are no good at prayer, If you feel like, I just suck at prayer, I just want you to know you're in good company today. This is a safe place for you. We're in this together, okay? So prayer, for our purposes in this series, is simply this, communing with God. This is talking with, listening to God. And our series, over four weeks, covers talking to God, talking with God, listening to God, and being with God. So last week, we covered talking to God. This week, we're moving to talking with God. So what's the difference, right? They sound kind of similar. Well, when Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, he responded with what is now known as the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, Some of you, whether you, maybe you grew up in church, you might know this by heart, even if you haven't been to church in a long time. Uh, Maybe if you grew up Catholic, this is known as the Our Father, that's right. Uh, This is Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, right? So on and so forth. Uh, This is what Jesus gave his disciples when they said, how should we pray? That same Crossway survey that that interviewed 14,000 Christians asked people the top reasons why they found it hard to pray. And the top two reasons, which combined made up 72% of the pie, were distraction and busyness. No surprise there, right? Uh, Corey Ten Boom famously said, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. But also in those top few barriers that people reported as making it difficult to pray were being at a loss for words. Anybody been there? Like trying to pray and just not knowing exactly what to say. I've been there. 
So Jesus helps us by giving us a pre-written prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. There's also the Psalms. There's a whole bunch of Christian prayers written over the centuries by people who say, here is, you know, words to pray when you feel like you don't have the words to pray. But uh, while that is helpful, pre-written prayers are sort of like training wheels on a bike. They can get you going and get you learning how to ride a bike. But eventually, the goal is to experience the freedom and relational intimacy of getting to use and find your own voice in prayer. This is often known as extemporaneous prayer. It's a big fancy church word. Today, we're just going to call it talking with God, okay? That's where we're going today. So uh, with that said, here's our scripture for today. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. This is written by Paul. He says this, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert And always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, notice here all of the all language, right? He says, pray on all occasions for all kinds of prayers and requests for all the Lord's people. So in short, when it comes to talking with God, here's our target. Pray everywhere for everything and everyone. That's it. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> it's a tall order, okay? It's a tall order. So uh, we are going to tackle this, uh, and, and I want to give some permission. Like I said from the front end, uh, there is grace in this process as we are on the bumpy journey of growing in prayer. Remember this. Prayer is not about getting better at prayer. Prayer is about getting closer with God. That's the whole point, okay? As Ian said last week, uh, we are... The aim is to move from discipline to delight. There is discipline involved, but the aim is to just delight in the presence of God. So today I'm going to throw a lot out there. There's going to be some hopefully really practical things for us to latch onto. Uh, that could feel overwhelming. My hope is that you would just pick one thing, if nothing else, just if something sticks out to you, say, there's one thing I can put into practice this week and just do it, okay? All right, so starting with that pray everywhere piece. Pray everywhere. Paul says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Okay, so we're going to get to that all occasions thing for a moment because that's where uh, the everywhere thing comes in. But I want to park on that in the Spirit piece for just a moment because that's sort of the key that unlocks the on all occasions part. So what does in the Spirit mean? What is Paul saying? Is he talking about praying in tongues? Is he talking about having a super spiritual like yoga meditation pose when you pray? It's none of those things. What does in the spirit mean? If you asked Jews before the time of Jesus, where should I pray? The answer would have been very, very simple. You go pray at the place where God is. And that was the temple. The temple was the center of religious life for uh, the Jewish people. It was central to how they viewed God. You go to the temple to pray. And the reason is tied to the main plot line of the Bible, right? So God in the beginning created humans to have perfect uninterrupted fellowship with him. And that was the case. There was communion. There was friendship. God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. And then sin entered the world, and because God is holy, the simple fact of the matter is God cannot dwell because he is perfectly holy with a sinful people. And so there's this problem from the beginning because God also loves us, which is strange and beautiful and amazing, but it creates a problem. Uh, how can a holy God dwell with a sinful people? It's really the center, the center question of the entire Bible, and it's the, the whole problem that the Bible is trying to solve. And the solution for thousands of years was the temple. The temple was a building on a tiny patch of real estate in Jerusalem with a room in the middle called the Holy of Holies where the undiluted presence of God would dwell. The Spirit of God would dwell there. And for even that to be made possible, that tiny little room to be made possible for God to dwell there, a whole constant stream of sacrifices had to be made to cleanse that space of human sin so that it would be a clean space for God to dwell. And even then, you could not just walk into the Holy of Holies. It was uh, cordoned off by this giant curtain from floor to ceiling, and it could be only entered once a year by one person, and that was the high priest, in order to make sacrifices for the people. So if you were a Jew, uh, you would go to the temple, you'd make sacrifices, and you would pray. But as you were praying, you would have this unmistakable notion that you were just close-ish to God when you were praying. That direct access to God was off the table. It was unthinkable. You just couldn't get there. And then Jesus arrived. And everything changed. And Paul is reflecting on the life and work of Jesus when he says this in Ephesians chapter 2, just a few chapters earlier. Listen. 
He says, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Catch this. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the turn of events that kind of Paul is teasing out here, that Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, stood in our place as a blood sacrifice once and for all to cover your sins and my sins, not just past, but present and future. And in the moment of Jesus' death, that temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. So the thing that separated the holy of holies was now gone, and the spirit of God was on the loose. And then at Pentecost, shortly after the resurrection, the Spirit descended like fire, we're told, on the first followers of Jesus. God looked at human beings who had trusted in the finished work of Jesus, cleansed by him, and said, I will make my home in them. Pentecost was the day that God stopped dwelling in a building and started dwelling in his people. The cry of Pentecost, then, is not go to where God is, but rather God is within you wherever you go. This was a seismic shift in how people saw and related to God. And all of it was made possible by the cross and resurrection of Jesus. All that's background. Okay, so what does that have to do with prayer? Okay? When Paul says pray in the spirit, he's essentially saying this. Any division between sacred time and secular time, between holy ground and common ground, ceased the moment the spirit of God took up residence in you. It's that simple. The spirit gives you, friend, full access to God the Father. This is why Paul says pray in the spirit. He's essentially saying this. Every occasion is an occasion for prayer because God is always with you. Friend, God is with you when you walk into church and when you walk into the doctor's office. So talk with him. God is with you when you study the Bible and when you study for the exam. So talk with him. He is with you when you are fighting sin and fighting with your sibling. So talk with him. He's with you when you're in the dining room and when you're in the boardroom. He's with you when you're trying to find a spouse and when you're trying to find a parking space. God is with you when you are changing jobs and when you are changing diapers. So friend, talk with him. Every occasion is an occasion for prayer because God is always with you. Now, for many of us, this is a big shift, right? Uh, Praying on all occasions can feel like an overwhelming task. So where do we start? Just start somewhere. So a good place to, uh, to begin, maybe you can do this right now, is to commit to praying a little more today than you prayed yesterday. That's it. And if you're looking for something practical, you can pull out your phone right now. Uh, I found this helpful. Set a timer or a, uh, an alarm for a random time tomorrow morning and a random time tomorrow afternoon. And when that thing goes off, you simply stop and you recognize God is with me in this place. And you invite him, say, God, you're with me here uh, in my cubicle, you're here with me on my lunch break, with this client, as I'm trying to calm my child, and you just spend one minute praying about that thing. And my guess is, some of you will find yourselves praying for things you've never prayed about. You'll find yourself inviting God into things you assumed he didn't much care about. You'll begin seeing something or some place as sacred for the first time. No matter where you go, the Spirit of God is with you. So make every occasion an occasion for prayer. Pray everywhere. Second, Paul says pray for everything. He says pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
Now, many of us, when we think of praying to God, we immediately think of asking God for things. And, and that is a legitimate category of prayer, but this is also uh, what characterizes my relationship with my bank. So uh, when do I call my bank? I call my bank when something is wrong. I don't call my bank just to process stress at work. I don't call my bank just to thank them for being my bank, even though maybe I should, that'd probably make somebody's day. I call my bank when something is not working the way it should. And the reality is that's how many of us interact with God. But in John 15, Jesus changed the game when he said, I no longer call you servants. I now call you friends. Think about your best friend for a moment. What do you talk with them about? There's a good chance you talk with them about all kinds of things, maybe even everything. You process life with that person because they know you and they are a safe place. This is how Paul is encouraging us to talk with God. He says, bring all all kinds of prayers and requests. So what kinds of prayers are there? There's all, all kinds of prayers in scripture. We talked about pre-written prayers, uh, thousands. If you were to boil all of them down, you can basically categorize them into six different buckets, okay? So I wanna put them on, on the screen here. Uh, these are super simple phrases. They're so simple that my two-year-old says every single one of these every day, okay? So when we talk about talking with God and finding our own voice, the language is really accessible, okay? Uh, you can incorporate this into your life by praying multiple minutes for each category, or you can have a very simple check-in. And for those of you who just wanna start somewhere, uh, I wanna show you that this can be done in like two minutes or less, like a daily check-in with God, okay? So, so here, here's what this might sound like. You start with, I love you. Say, God, I love you. You are good. You, you are the one who satisfies the longings of my heart. And as I'm looking at today, there are gonna be a lot of things that are competing for my attention and affection. And in the midst of all those things, I love you the most. God, thank you. Uh, thank you for access to you in prayer. Thank you for breath in my lungs this morning. Thank you that I have a church family that has cared so well for me and my family. Thank you for my new community group and the friendships that are forming there. Thank you for the weather today. Thank you that I didn't walk outside and become immediately angry because I'm walking into an armpit. Like, thank you that there is fall weather in Tennessee. Thank you. Uh, God, I wanna say sorry. I'm sorry for being short-tempered with Kasha yesterday. I was on edge and I kind of, she got the brunt of it. I wanna say sorry for my heart during that group dinner last week. I, I felt like I was constantly making the conversation back towards me and that was selfish. I'm sorry. I wanna say I'm frustrated today, God. Last night was a tough night with my son, Elon. We were up having seizures and he was vomiting and it's hard to watch that. I look at him struggle and I want better for him. Have mercy. God, this last week has been full, so I wanna say, please, would you help me this week? Help me to say yes to the right things and say no to the right things. I felt anxiety creep in this last week, and so I pray that you would be near to me. Give me peace, give me calm. Remind me that you love me and that I'm yours. Help me to remember that. And God, today I say yes to you. Today I have a lot of plans for my life, but I wanna say yes to your plans first. So help me to be interruptible. I yield to you. Help me to be sensitive to your spirit. Help me say yes to you, even when it's hard. God, thank you for hearing me. Thank you that you love me. Be with me today, in Jesus' name, amen. You see how that can be done in a couple minutes on your commute, before you leave, on your lunch break? Hopefully giving uh, these categories gives you a sense that you can pray in your own voice as you go about your day. And some of these categories will come naturally to you, right? So maybe praise comes easily to you, but maybe confession doesn't. Uh, and maybe petition comes easily, but that posture of yes or surrender doesn't. So this helps create sort of a well-rounded prayer life so that we're not just praying to God like we talk to our bank. Maybe you wanna take a picture of this. Maybe you want to keep it on your phone. Maybe you wanna schedule a two-minute check-in with God at some point in time during your day. My, my hunch is if you pray through these categories in your like appointment with God, like your morning quiet time with God, you'll find yourself as you go about your day, responding to things, not just with emotions, but with prayer. So if something great happens, you're not just happy about it, you're actually praising God for it. If something sad happens, you're not just sad about it, you're actually going to God about it. You fall into sin, you're not just guilty about it, you're confessing it, keeping short accounts with God. 
God knows that you go through all sorts of things in your life. So pray about all sorts of things. God knows that you need all kinds of things in your life. So make all sorts of requests. He is there to listen to you. Friends, God loves you, and he is the safest possible place to go to with everything in life. So pray about everything. Third, we to pray for, pray everywhere, pray about everything, and thirdly, pray for everyone. Paul says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So there are two commands here. The first is be alert, and the second is to pray for others. The fancy church word for praying for others is intercession, right, to intercede for somebody. Uh, it's fancy. Basically, it just means to go to God and intervene on somebody's behalf, to intervene on somebody's behalf. Uh, so I mentioned I have a two-year-old. Uh, his name is Rowan. We call him Jojo. There he is uh, with one of our chickens, uh, which is his friend, uh, the trapped friend in our backyard. And... Uh, I would say about 90%, 98% of parenting JoJo up until this point has been uh, uh, prevention of death and significant bodily injury. Uh, and, um, and, and my wife is way better at this than me. I just want to acknowledge that. So like we'll go out and bring our kids to a friend's house. They've got other kids and we'll let them go play together. And we'll get in the car at the end of the night and I'll be like, man, JoJo did great. And Cash will turn to me and be like, are you kidding? Did you not see when he grabbed the knife or when he was backing up towards the stairs? Or how about when he ran towards the pond? Where, like, did you not see any of those things? Like, she, she catches uh, on to this way better than I am. She, she's like Jason Bourne. When she enters a room, she, like, her brain scans for all the sharp objects in the exits. And she, like, instinctively knows how fast she can sprint at that altitude. Like, I am, this may or may not be a sore spot in my marriage, but she is way better at that than, than I am. Uh, because she knows that a place doesn't have to look dangerous in order for it to be dangerous. Because as it turns out, two-year-olds can weaponize anything, anything at all, right? So she, she knows to look for danger even when it doesn't look like there is danger. I promise I'm trying to get better at this, okay? Uh, pray, pray, for, pray for us. Those of you who interact with little children know this. Uh, it is a good thing to be alert <laughs> and be ready to intervene, right? So why does Paul say this about prayer? Uh, this is where context is important. So Ephesians 6.18 falls in this chapter where Paul is essentially painting a picture of a battlefield. So I want you to uh, hear what he says. This is a few verses earlier uh, in verse 10. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And then he goes on to list various pieces of armor that God has given us in Christ. So he talks about a helmet of salvation and a breastplate of righteousness, right? And a shield of faith. And then at the tail end, he finishes with this bit on prayer. He says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So we live in a world that's warped by sin, right? Undoubtedly. And, and, and not everything can be linked to the devil and his schemes, right? Satan is not behind every flat tire and every stubbed toe. But Satan does have schemes. He is a deceiver. And being the deceiver that he is, part of his strategy is to go unnoticed. And so the question facing us today is, are we aware that we are in the midst of a battle? Are we aware that we have an enemy, that we struggle against not just natural forces, but spiritual forces? Paul says, be alert, be alert, and be alert on behalf of others. So I, 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 Satan is a deceiver, right? So are we, are we alert to the ways in which Satan might be tempting people in our life to believe lies rather than truth? Satan is somebody who lures people into sin, a sin that always overpromises and underdelivers. And so are we aware of the sort of uh, socially acceptable sins in our spheres of influence? We know that Satan likes to divide. So do we participate in gossip and slander and believers tearing each other down? Or does something flag in us that says, this is actually Satan at work right now? Paul says to be alert. And he says... In our alertness, we are to pray for everyone. See, according to Paul, prayer is not a platitude. It is not a nice thought. 
It is not a mental exercise. According to Paul, prayer is warfare and nothing short of it. Prayer is nothing less, listen, than accepting God's invitation for us to take our place given to us by Christ as co-rulers with him, joining him in pushing back the kingdom of darkness and ushering in the kingdom of God here and now. Prayer is powerful, and that's why prayer is an act of war. It's an act of intervention on behalf of other people. So is there opportunity for you today to grow in praying for people around you? One way to do this is to simply incorporate prayer in your private quiet times. Uh, so, so keeping a list of people. Do you have people in your life who need prayer about, for something? Start making a list. Just make a list of their name and what they need prayer for. And, and just work through a couple names. You don't have to like the whole list every day. Just a couple names every time you sit down with God and pray for those people. A good way to do this uh, for people that you aren't, maybe don't have on a list, uh, the way to expand your prayer life for others is to ask the Spirit to speak in those times. Do you know that He speaks to you? So say, uh, God, I don't know who to pray for right now, but I'm opening my heart to you and I'm saying, H -h call somebody to mind. And, and so you just close your eyes and you see who God, who God brings to mind in front of you. And then you say, God, how are you calling me to pray for that person? Maybe it's somebody who, yeah, that's obvious, I know, to pray for them. Maybe it's somebody you didn't expect. How are you calling me to pray for that person? And sim you simply pray for wisdom, for encouragement, for their salvation, financial provision, healing, whatever God calls to mind. Pray for that over that person. <laughs> Praying quietly, silently for others as we go about our days is a great place to start. But as we grow, a good and right path is for us to learn how to pray out loud for other people. I'd be curious, uh, ra raise your hand if you have ever prayed out loud for somebody in your life. That's a lot of you. I'm so encouraged. That's amazing. Some of you, that's like an easy thing. Some of you, it's a natural thing. Uh, for others of us, we think, I I'm seeing somebody pray over somebody else in the lobby at church. I could never do that. And here's what I want to say. It is more possible than you think. It is more possible than you think. And you will get a joy out of that that will be surprising to you. It's such a pleasure when you learn how to pray out loud for people. But you'll never actually begin doing it unless you just kind of go for it eventually. There has to be a time where you just try it out. Okay? So uh, if you are struggling, I would say this. Begin praying for courage to pray out loud for people. We, had, we saw this happen right here in this room. Uh, in the prayer room this last week, a guy came up to Pastor Stone and he said, can you please pray for me for courage to pray out loud for other people? And Stone laid a hand on him and prayed. I love that. That's fantastic. So my encouragement, we have this prayer room going on for 21 days. Use that as a workshop this week. The prayer room is not for professional prayers. The prayer room is for people who want to get better at prayer. And there could not be a safer place to try this out. You are in a room full of people who are here for the exact same reason as you are, okay? So just show up and do the bold thing. Maybe introduce you to somebody. Say, hey, my name's, my, my name's so-and-so, my name's Corey. How can I pray for you today? And then you just pray for them. Just try it. It'll bless them, it'll bless you, I promise. If you're in a community group, carve out time to pray for each other in group. If you're a group leader, make time to do this. I know of so many people who've gone from terrified to pray out loud to learning how to stumble through a prayer and then becoming able to pray anywhere they go community group was a transformative place for them. If you're not praying out loud for each other in the community group, begin trying it. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I can't imagine going about my day and in my neighborhood or my workplace or uh, with the store, just stopping and praying out loud for somebody. Like, how do you do that without it being super strange and shoehorned into the day? Here's what I found to be true. Good practice. When someone offers you their pain, offer them prayer. It's as simple as that. What I found is that 99% of people, if you, if, if they're sharing about something that's going on in their life and you ask if you can pray for them, that even, even if they are not a Christian, even if they would never step foot in a church or have a conversation about Jesus, if you offer to pray for a pain point in their life, they will almost always say yes. And so you're listening, you're having a conversation and oh, you hear it, right? The, the pain point. My, my mom has cancer. My, my, my kid's being bullied in school. Our family dog is dying. There's a bill that I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to pay. You hear that and you're alert, right? And you simply say, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Can I pray for you right now? 
and then you pray for them. And don't be a weirdo. Don't like put your hands on their face, right? And, and like, you just like, uh, and keep it short, okay? Keep it short. You just say, uh, God, you love Eric. You hate cancer. So I, I know that you're a healer. Would you heal him? Give the doctors wisdom. Let Eric know you love him in Jesus' name, amen. It could be as simple as that. It took 10 seconds and I promise it will be impactful for the person that you're praying for and it will be impactful for you. When somebody offers you their pain, offer them prayer. When you give it, begin to pray over people, I promise, friends, you'll begin to see breakthrough moments in your spiritual journey. There's untapped potential as you learn to pray wherever you go for the people you meet. So as we finish up our time together, I threw a whole lot out. I'm gonna summarize some of it on the screen here. Pick one, that's it. So if you don't have a daily appointment with God, Maybe it's time to schedule one. Start your day in prayer, reading scripture. Maybe it's setting those reminders on your phone so they go off at random times so you're praying about things you've never prayed be about before. Maybe it's using those prayer postures so that you have a well-rounded prayer life. You realize for the first time I can talk to God about anything and everything in my own words. Maybe it's praying spirit-led, praying for people that are being called to mind, not because you thought of them, but because God brought them to your mind. Maybe it's making a list of people and systematically working through it. Maybe texting those people when you get done praying. I prayed for you today. Showing up to the prayer room. Maybe just once this week, be in this space. Be at Cabin Coffee if you're at Columbia. Pray for somebody out loud. This is a safe place to try that. Pray for a Christian. And if you need a stretch mode, maybe you've never prayed for a non-Christian before. Listen for pain. When somebody offers you their pain, offer them prayer. Here's what I say. Nobody's going to be checking up on you on these things. This is between you and God. You get what you put into this. And it is a safe place to fumble through and learn how to pray. We are in this together, friends. And if you remember nothing else, remember what Ronald Rollheiser said. The only rule of prayer is to just show up and to keep showing up. I don't know what would happen to our church, our neighborhood, our city, if we became people who began praying everywhere about everything and for everyone. But I can tell you this, I sure as heck want to find out. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at Bridge Church TN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.